Hi everyone, this is Stephen, host of Computer Art Explorers. Welcome to our Introduction to Computer Programming series. In this episode, we're going to explore how to use floating point variables. For the best viewing experience, please remember to watch this video in HD 1080 on a large monitor. Okay, to get started, I'm going to go ahead and open up this window. This is the Cyboss application developer, and the source code here is floating point example. Uh, this was written specifically for this video. In the previous lesson, we discussed integer variables. Now, integer variables do have some notable limitations. Biggest limitation is it can only hold whole numbers and within a limited range, and the range is right here. In this lesson, we're going to discuss floating point variables as they're used by the Cyboss programming language. Now you'll notice right here in this section of code listed there are nine floating point variables. Now we're going to talk about why each one of these is a floating point variable and not some other type of variable. So let's look at our data types. In Cyboss you can have integers, floats, strings, or an int64 type. So those are the four types of variables that you can have. The integer variables, they all end in a percent sign. The string variables, they all end in a dollar sign. And the int64 type all end in the pound sign. So if it doesn't, if the variable does not end in one of those characters, then it is in fact a floating point variable. So that's the reason why each one of these is a floating point variable. And when you have a floating point variable, and then an equal sign, which you have, is you have a floating point assignment statement. Okay, so let's take a look at assignment statements. You have the assignee variable, and in this case here, this two-thirds is the assignee variable. Then you have an equal sign. So anytime the assignee variable is followed by an equal sign, followed by a valid expression or a function, all of that is considered to be an assignment statement. So this is the expression, and this happens to be what's called a floating point expression because the assignee variable is a floating point variable. If the assignee variable was an integer variable, then the expression would be considered an integer expression, and that whole statement or a whole assignment would be an integer assignment. Now, integer assignments were covered in the previous lesson, so if you haven't watched that, I highly recommend you watch that lesson first and then come back to this lesson and watch this lesson. So let's move on to the floating point assignment, and let's talk about what is actually happening here. So the equals, and then here's the expression. When this gets evaluated, this number two is a constant value. This number gets loaded into an internal 64-bit floating point variable. Okay, so let's talk about what happens when this gets evaluated. This two gets loaded into a floating point operand, and the three gets loaded into a separate floating point operand, and these two are then divided using floating point math and the result is a floating point value that gets assigned to this variable. Now this is important to understand because for like down here under x, you have x equals, this, is, this number here is actually considered to be an operand. It's just the fact that you, there are no operators. You could have an operator and you could say times, let's say seven, for example, okay? You could do that. This is an operand. The multiplication is an operator, and this is an operand. Every operand can be a floating point value, okay? So if we even have one operand with no operators, then this is the result gets assigned to x. Otherwise, the expression gets evaluated, the result of which gets assigned to the assignee variable, whatever it is. Let's go ahead and run this and take a look at it. So notice here under two-thirds, I'm going to skip over all this for just a minute and focus on this. So the value of two-thirds, this is a variable named two-thirds, 
and the value two-thirds is 0 0.66 and it would be sixes out to infinity. Now the IEEE 754 standard format is what is actually being used to hold this number and no floating point format can hold all values perfectly. They can hold some values perfectly, other values not, not so. For example, the one half, notice 0 0.5, the decimal value is held perfectly by this floating point format. 0.25, held perfectly as one quarter, right? Notice comes down to a third. Again, it cannot be held perfectly. Right there, that's a one. Again, if it was threes to infinity, uh, then it would be perfect. One sixth. You might think, well, this looks perfect. Well, no, because it's not carrying the sixes out to infinity. So it is slightly less than one sixth. It's being underestimated just slightly. Same with one third, underestimated just slightly. One eighth, perfect. I'm pointing this out so that you understand that there are slight limitations to the precision that you can hold certain values. Now I'm going to explain what you're looking at here. The 64 bits of data, this, all these ones and zeros, this, this, this bit right here is the sign bit. So if the number is negative, then the sign bit would be one, showing a negative number. Uh, the exponent and the mentissa these bits right here are actually used to hold the actual value itself. Now, how this value is held by these bits is really a very complicated subject. And it's a subject that's way beyond the scope of this video, except we're going to go over to the internet. And notice here at this web address, there is a great article by Carl Birch. So if you want to read this article, this article does explain in rather great detail how floating point values are actually stored in ones and zeros. And it also talks about the limitations. And so from a very basic level, if you know nothing about it and you want to learn how does this actually work, it talks about all of that. It then talks about the IEEE standard. I'm going to read this here. It says, nearly all computers today follow the IEEE 754 standard for representing floating point numbers. It talks about when it was developed and formally adopted. It also shows the most common formats of this standard are right in here. Now, the Cyboss language uses this right here, the IEEE 64-bit standard. Cutting back over here to our example where we have like two-thirds. These are the ones and zeros, the 64 bits. This right here is a hexadecimal representation of these 64 bits. So right here you're looking at it in binary, right here you're looking at it in hexadecimal. Okay, so here's a good example of one of the problems you have with the fact that the value of 1 6 is slightly underestimated. So we're taking 1 divided by 6, assigning it to the 1 6 value, we're going to add up six of the one sixth values. Okay, now theoretically that should equal one. And so we have one here, we've assigned one so you can see what one actually is. And let's go ahead and just run and compile this and take a look at it. Notice what's happened here that the value of one, this is the representation right here for one, and it's showing one. Here's the representation for 1 sixth, but because 1 sixth is slightly underestimated, when you add up this value six times, it winds up being not exactly one. It's slightly underestimated, okay? Now, typically, you don't need to have things carry out that far, so when you actually go to print your data out, you can round it, and it may not be a problem at that point. However, if you're going to try and compare a result that you add up, like say six values, and you don't use any rounding, and you try and compare that to say one and say is that equal to one, you can wind up with an error because of the underestimation. Okay, in this next example, we're going to talk about the square root of negative one, which is not a real number, so we're going to see how that gets handled. Show pi, we're going to talk about that. And we're also going to talk about the largest accurate whole number to the smallest accurate whole number. 
So let's go ahead and compile and run that. So the square root of negative one, because it's not a real number, you're gonna get this FP indeterminate NAN. NAN means not a number. So just know that this is a valid keyword constant. It's gonna print this out, but you could also take this as a keyword constant and you could assign that to any floating point variable. The next thing is pi. So you looking here, you'll see we have 17 digits of pi. Technically, the 17th digit should be a two. Uh, however, this is where you're getting into, it's being slightly underestimated because uh, the IEEE 754 standard can only represent pi to 16 significant digits uh, using this, this format right here. So the first 16 digits here are accurate, but the 17th digit should be a two and it cannot be held by this format. So, and of course, pi continues on and on and on and on, but that's, that's a pretty good accurate representation of pi. The largest accurate whole number that can be held is this number right here. So that's a much, much larger number than is held by your 32-bit signed integers. And so this is a positive value down to a negative number. So every whole number within this range, okay, from this positive number all the way to this negative number can be held accurately by this IEEE 754 standard format. Okay, in this next section right here, I'm gonna point out that there's a maximum number that can be held by a floating point, and there's a few numbers here. Notice these are floating point keyword constants. There's a few of them here that are listed, and one of them happens to be the maximum number. So if you just need to know well, what's the largest number that can possibly be held by a float variable, go ahead and compile and run this. You can use that number and it's telling you right here, it's a 1.7 and it goes on and on and on, e to the plus 308. The smallest number greater than one is this number right here. So notice you have one going all the way down and then a two right here. So that is the smallest number larger than one that can be held by this standard format. Notice positive infinity and the negative infinity and then uh, what I've got here under Z, I put Z equals two to the power of 300. So let's just go ahead and compile and run this again, look at it. And notice for positive infinity, there's this pattern and it's coming up with positive infinity, negative infinity. So those are the values that we assigned. And notice again how it's lighting up in purple and that's because I'm gonna to to click on this here and brings it up that is showing you that this is a valid floating point keyword constant in the Cyboss language. And this pattern, let's go back into it and I wanna show you that uh, this pattern right here is all, all ones under the exponent along with all zeros for the mantissa. This is a reserve pattern in this format that specifies infinity with the sign being zero or one indicating either positive or negative infinity. Notice Z, uh, it was two to the power of 300 and that's giving us this value right here. However, if we do a larger number, say if we take it to the power of 3000 instead of the power of 300 and compile and run it again, you will notice what happens. It, it is then returning, it's doing the computation and it's returning uh, positive infinity as the result. Now we're going to discuss how to use numeric format schemes and print channels to output formatted floating point data. Okay, so here we've set up two variables, A and B, and you can see the values here. For A, it'll be one third, and for B, it'll be 153.125. And we're just going to print them out one on top of the other and without any formatting, just so that you can see what happens by default. So let's go ahead and compile and run this. And you'll notice right off the bat that the length of the numbers is different. Uh, the number of decimal places is different. And where the decimal point appears is different. So let's say we wanna take these two numbers and 
let's say that these two numbers represent the value of, let's say, money. So let's say this, uh, this one third, this is actually 33 and a third cents. And the 153.125 is actually a dollar value of $153, 12 and a half cents. So what we'd like to do is maybe round it off to make this 153.13 and round this off to 33 cents. But we want that to, let's say, print out so that the decimal points line up and we'd like to also maybe put a dollar sign in there. Okay, so you'll notice that I've made some changes to the code. The values here of A and B are gonna get printed out in a formatted way, but it's important to understand that the actual data values of A and B are not going to change. So let's go ahead and compile and run this and take a look at it. So you'll notice here that we have achieved what we wanted. We now have a dollar sign. We also have a decimal point and two decimal places and rounded off properly. Notice 153.13. It's showing you the value rounded off. Now it's important to understand one more time that just because it's saying B equals this rounded off value, that doesn't mean that's what B in fact really equals. B in memory still equals the 153.125. That has not changed. It's just that that value has been taken from B and then formatted to be printed on the screen using this scheme. So let's go ahead and talk about uh, why certain things are the way they are. For example, the fixed field size, it was 10. If we need a bigger fixed field size, we can make it 20. We could actually make it oh, almost anything we want. So there's 20 right there. And let's go ahead and change this because I want to show you how to use some flags here. Let's say, let's make this 20,153. And let's just go ahead and compile and run that. So you'll notice right here, 20,153. Now, let's say you want to add commas. You like to have commas in there automatically. So what we need to do is go over to our numeric format scheme. I'm going to go ahead and open this up and click on it. You'll notice here that there's all these different flags. Now we're going to kind of talk about what these flags do. First off, right here, this flag, the round off to two decimal places. So, for example, if we wanted it to round off to three decimal places, we just put in three. I'll go ahead and compile and run it so you can see. And there you have three decimal places. Notice the rounding. It did This didn't become a three because it rounded it off here at this location. So. Let's go back to two, and we want to insert the commas, so let's go ahead and do that. There is a flag. Let's go down here and take a look at the flags. See this flag here, the NSF show commas flag? So what we want to do is we want to add this to our, the flags that we're used specifying for this function. Okay, so this uh, variable right here, this integer variable, is being assigned all of these different flags. And then this variable is being passed here to the open numeric format scheme. And if we go down and we look, you'll notice that the fourth parameter is an integer assignment statement. And in that statement, you can have one or more NSF prefix flags. So these flags could actually be listed in the code down here. It's just easier for me to add and take flags out if I set it up like this, because then I can just like take a flag out, I can highlight it and just so or if I want to bring it back and just hit undo. So that's the reason why I've set this up for all of these values to be computed, stored to a variable, and then pass the variable with the contents of all these flags in it. The number of leading spaces and the number of trailing spaces. So let's go ahead and just compile and run it so you can see the fact that we do have the commas in there. So there it inserted a comma, and if this was a larger number, it would insert as many commas as appropriate. And if we wanted to have, let's say, a trailing space, put one trailing space. So you'll notice that it prints the number and then there's one trailing space. Uh, this becomes really helpful if you happen to be, let's say, generating uh, data for a report that's formatted and you want to line up all your values in nice columns on the report. And maybe you want a couple of leading and trailing spaces. Okay, you're not going to be able to see the leading spaces too easily in this but they're gonna be there. So if you wanna have two, two leading spaces and then two trailing spaces, they're there. If the number were to get too big, it, wouldn't, it won't print. And I'm gonna show you what's gonna happen. Let's say if uh, 
we make a larger number. I'll just do something like this for a moment. Okay, and so it's filling this with pound signs, and that's showing you visually that there is a numeric formatting error. Specifically, this field is not large enough. Uh, the reason it didn't actually throw the error, it just filled it in with pound signs, is because I specified this flag right here. Don't throw numeric formatting errors. Okay, so next, I'm, what I'm going to do is go ahead and change this uh, field size. I'm going to make this 50, and I'm going to drop these down to zero so we don't have any leading or trailing spaces. Let's go ahead and recompile this. So you'll notice from here to here is now 50 spaces. That's our fixed field size. And now there's plenty of room for this number to print. So it in fact did print. Okay, so I've made a few changes to the code here. Um, I took off the rounding, so it's not gonna round it off. And I've set the values A and B. So for $1.50 for A and $1.93 for B. So let's just go ahead and compile and run this and take a look at it. So you'll notice uh, without the rounding, it's 1.929. That's because the floating point variable cannot hold the value of 1.93 perfectly. Now, this can actually cause a problem if you are writing an accounting program and maybe you really need to store every value perfectly that you can use in money to the penny. So you really need to store the value as $1.93. So the easiest way to do this is is instead of storing A and B as like a dollar fifty, is to store the value in hundreds. So for example, you're going to store the values as 150 pennies, if you want to think of it that way, and B would be 193 pennies. Now, obviously, if we print this out just without doing anything else, that's going to cause a problem because that's not going to print out correctly. So let's take a look at a flag that will actually make that work for us. I'm going to open this up here under the numeric format scheme and it shows you here on these uh, the value represents so these values don't represent actual amounts these values are representing the amount in hundreds okay so this is a hundred and fifty hundredths of a dollar so all we have to do is take this flag here and let the numeric format scheme know that the values that we're going to be passing and formatting using the scheme, the value that's going to be passed is in fact a represents the hundredths of a value. So in this case, let's go ahead now and compile and run it. Now it's printing it and formatting it the way we want it to. $1.50, it's showing exactly what we want to. $1.93 shows it exactly the way we want to. And the numbers are held perfectly in memory so that they can be added. Now remember, you can have values 2 to the 53. That's the largest number you can have. So let's just go ahead and take a look at that. And you'll notice that that is, this right here is the largest number. So that would be what? Uh, thousands, millions, billions, trillions. So you could accurately hold a number of $90 trillion accurately by a floating point value and print it out accurately. Okay, now there could be other applications. Uh, let's say take the money sign out. We're not gonna be using money. And let's say that uh, maybe the value is gonna represent, uh, for example, millions, okay? You might be doing something, some kind of a scientific program. And let's just go ahead and compile that and run that. And you'll notice that the values, each value is being taken out to the one millionth place and rounded off at that place. So it's automatically being rounded at that place and all the values are gonna line up and it's gonna print. Again, there's commas in there because the comma flag is still being specified. Uh, the dollar sign is no longer there because that was not being specified. Let's take a look at a few of these other flags down here. If for whatever reason you wanted all your numbers to print out in scientific notation, you could use the scientific notation flag. And let's just go ahead and compile and run this. You'll notice that no matter what the number is, okay, even uh, the 193, it's going to be printed out in scientific notation. 
Now, you can use the rounding flags. Let's say we want to have scientific notation, but we don't want to have this many significant digits. Let's say we want to round this off to four significant digits after the decimal point. That would actually take this to 0072. So let's go ahead and add a flag that will do that. And all we need is one of our rounding flags. We'll round off to four decimal places. And so there you go. You'll notice how that got rounded to the 0072. And all the numbers are going to get printed the same way. Now, let's go ahead and make one of these numbers negative. Make a minus 193 and compile and run this again. So it's putting a plus sign and a minus sign. If for whatever reason you did not want that plus sign to show if it's a positive number, you can use hide plus sign. So I'll go ahead and change this flag to the hide plus sign, compile and run it. And notice that it does not print out. Now, so far, we haven't really talked about how this is actually working using the print channel. We've just been using it. So I want to talk about this, uh, the numeric format scheme. This scheme is telling how to format a value. We can take the scheme and we can use something called the decimal string function. And we could take any value, all right? Let's say we take the value of a 173. So here's, notice the floating point value, okay? Or it could be a floating point expression. We could say 173 times three, for example, okay? So that's my floating point expression as my first parameter. And there's your first parameter right there as a floating point expression. And the second parameter is gonna be the numeric format scheme handle. So in this case right here, this numeric format scheme, this function right here, here's the four parameters for this function, and it then opens up a scheme and returns a handle to it. So here's your integer out, and it is your numeric format scheme handle. So that handle then gets passed into other functions. For example, in this case here, under the decimal string function, we're going to pass in the numeric format scheme handle. And we're saying we want to format the value, the floating point value that is passed. And in this case, because we have a floating point expression, this is going to get evaluated. The result is going to get passed. And it's going to be the value that is then formatted as an ASCII string. So it's going to notice here, for it returns a string. So we can either print the result. You can print the string that comes out. I'm going to put a pause statement here. This is going to run the program and pause it. Okay, so there it printed it. So let's, let's assign it to a value. It, since it's, a, it's returning a string value, we can actually assign it to, let's say, a string. And we can then do a couple of things with a string. Number one, we can look at the length of it. So now it's what it's going to do. It's just going to print out the length of it, and then it's going to print out the actual string itself inside of these carrots. So it's clear to see where the string starts and where the string ends. So there you go. The length is 30. And so right there, it starts right here. It ends right here. If you want to bring up the text grid, you can bring the text grid up, and you can actually see each individual space this way. It's real easy. Okay. So from here to here, 30 characters. So this value, this numeric format scheme handle, again, we change it to 20. The scheme got changed, all right? And notice it shrank. The length is now only 20. You can set up more than one scheme, okay? You could have a scheme that is, let's say, 30 characters wide, and let's call that NSF2, right? And maybe even on, on this scheme, we want to have uh, one trailing space. So it's going to be 30 total with, with one trailing space. Okay, so I went ahead and made some changes to the code so that we are generating A string using the NSF1 and B string using the NSF2. So I'm just showing you this so that you understand you can have multiple numeric format schemes. Each one of them has a different handle. And then we're going to use the numeric format scheme to generate a value for a string. And then we're going to use NFS2 
the format scheme to generate a value for B string. And then we're going to print out the length of each one along with the value of each one. So let's go ahead and run this and look at it. The A string is 20 characters long. The B string is 30 characters long. And you can see the actual data here. So again, if we were to bring up our text grid, just to make it easier to see the spaces, you can see clearly that right here is your one trailing space that was added right here, the number of trailing spaces. So in the second scheme, we wanted one trailing space. There it is. Notice there's no trailing space here in the first scheme. Now let's move on to print channels. So what we have here is the open VTG print channel function. And this function is returning a handle. If you notice right here is the function. Here's this integer that it's returning. And if you look down here, it, the integer is the print channel handle. So what the print channel allows you to do is to format text in a certain way. For example, these parameters here, I'm going to look at this parameter right here, the SF bold. This is a screen font handle. And what that's going to allow it to do is it's specifying the bold print. Now, there are some other types of default fonts that the uh, Cyboss runtime engine creates. All of those are listed right here. So you could go with a regular font, a bold font, an italic font. Uh, we'll switch that out and take a look at it. And there's also color schemes. You can create your own color scheme and you can open that up and define it any way you want. So you could define the background color to be any color and the foreground color to be any color, have a unique candle and you could pass that in. Or you can use one of these defaults that are set up by the system. So for right now, it's just using a bold font with a black color scheme. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Let's go ahead and run it. And I just want to point out that what we're going to do is we're going to print. And what you're seeing here is none. This is simply indicating that we're not using a print channel to print this line of data. Then on the following line, we're going to use the PC text. So this print channel handle right here. And that's why in the text, we're going to print that on the screen so you can actually see it in our output. And then we're just going to say A equals in the value of A. And here we've assigned the value of A 2 to the power of 53. So let's go ahead and run this and take a look at it. So here in the output, you can clearly see the difference. This is like regular font right here, whereas what's below it is a bold font. You can see how much heavier and darker that bold font is. So there's your difference there. And again, if you wanted to uh, go back into that, and let's say you wanted to do a, a bold italic. You want to change it to that for whatever reason. You want to use that font. Let's compile and run it. So there you can see that the entire font, everything it's printing out is bold italic. You can also change the color. Okay, so again, let's go back. And perhaps you'd like to change it to red. So there's red. Okay, and notice that CSB, the, the B indicates a black background. If you don't want that black background, take that out. Both of those keyword constants are in that list. And there's your red on white. Okay, so let's go back and look at this. Here are the five parameters. So here's the five parameters. So we've talked about the screen font handle and the color scheme. And if you notice what it's listing here as far as what it is, I've, I've pretty much copied the labels over here so you can see them in the code. We have the active VTG. It's outputting data to whatever the active VTG is when you print. Now, the concept of the active VTG is beyond the scope of this particular video. There's going to be another video talking about VTGs in runtime windows. And this is going to make a lot more sense to you after you watch that video. Um, but just go ahead and watch these in orders and just understand for right now when we're using this command to print to the active VTG without doing anything else, it's going to print it into this what's called the virtual text grid that this window right here, the master runtime window, is taking a look at. And of course, you can always bring up the grid. This is the grid snap button right here. You can bring this up so you can see the spaces and you can see how everything is being formatted. Okay, 
Now, let's move down and take a look at the numeric format scheme handle. Now, notice it's a null right now. That's, it says default. So it's just using the standard default, just like the print with no print channel. If you notice the A here and the A here, we'll go ahead and run this again and show you that there's no difference. Okay, these are being formatted identically because there's a system default format. So if you don't specify a numeric format scheme, it's gonna use the default. But let's say you wanna use a scheme and it happens, let's say the scheme that we defined as the NFS1. I'm going to plug that in right here and rerun it. So now look what you have, scientific notation format. And that's why you're getting that. And it's also in a fixed field. So it's formatting that data and it's putting it right here. Now I'm going to go ahead and change a couple of things. One is I'm going to take out this italics. But we'll go ahead and leave that in, in red print. Okay, and for people who are very new to this, I just want to point out that these five parameters right here where I have them listed as far as the first parameter, a comma, the second parameter, a comma. You can list them like this, or you can list them just in a row. It doesn't matter. The Anytime you have a comma, you can either continue on the same line, or you can drop the text to the next line. The compiler is going to read it exactly the same. Uh, the double slash here, that turns all of the rest of this into a remark. And the compiler, when it compiles your source code, it ignores remarks. So the uh, Cyboss application developer is turning the remarks into this like blue italic font. And that's a visual indicator to you that it is a valid remark. And so here I have five values, okay, A through E, have these different values that are being assigned to the variables. I'm then going to print out uh, using PC text, the idea is, is that we're going to print out the label, okay, and then we're going to say print using the PC number, or this print channel handle, print and tab over to the column 8, and then print the value of A. And notice the colons here, okay, all a colon does is separate statements from each other. You can separate statements with either a line, Okay, and they don't have to be lined up. I, I line these things up to make it easier to read. The compiler is going to read it just fine, even if it's off like that, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that when you have a statement, uh, the statement either has to end in a carriage return, which carriage return just goes to your next line, or a colon. Okay, and the colon just says, hey, we're, we're separating individual statements on the same physical line. That's all it means. So if you notice here, the semicolon. When you have a print statement and it prints out some data, if you do not end in a semicolon, then it will automatically print a carriage return. Let's just go ahead and compile and run this and take a look at what happens if we take out that semicolon. So you notice taking out the semicolon, it printed A equals, and then it automatically kicked in a carriage return, and then the next statement started from here, and it tabbed over to 8 and printed the value. So just wanted to point that out. That, that is what the semicolon is doing. And of course, this last print statement here, this is just printing an extra line. So this print statement is having a carriage return. A print with nothing else is just printing another carriage return. And that's the reason why you have one carriage return comes here, the next print goes here. And I did that simply just to space these out. So. Again, if you notice here, all of these are being formatted using scientific notation because we're using the print number, which is using NSF1, and these are your flags being specified. So if we don't want that, we have to change it to something else. This part of the text is being formatted using the PC text print channel, and this, the number here, is being formatted using the print channel that uses PC number. So you could set up any number of print channels and create numeric format schemes that are unique to each one of them and then use them in your program however you desire. And that concludes this video. Uh, if you like this video, go ahead and give it the thumbs up and go ahead and hit that subscribe button.